Hello and welcome back to Murder Analyze, my partners in crime and thank you for joining me again today for another true crime. Now this crime is unsolved and I must say it's been unsolved because it's a 1971 case and it's been unsolved for all these years up until today. But I think with the new techniques in uh, DNA, DNA advancement and stuff, I don't think this case will be always unsolved. The people who's the perpetrator of this crime may have probably died by the time this crime has actually come out. You know, the DNA of this person comes out and stuff. But I actually do believe that the, with the new DNA testing and stuff we've got now, the advancements in it and the stuff that's used in this case and is being used and, and stuff now all around the world on cold cases like this, there will be some something that comes out of this case. Now there is certain suspects, there's certainly other in this case, um, but they're suspects and there's one main suspect. But again, so this DNA, if we can get it, if they can really, really um, get some, you know, um, even something from it, it will either prove or disprove um, the theories that have been going around for years around it on this murder or murders of these two young people. Now this is the Valentine's Day uh, murders or it's classed as the Valentine's Day murders because it's today is February the 14th 2022 and this dates back right to Valentine's Day 1971 and it was in the evening and we have this young couple this Jess McBain and his um, lovely girlfriend Patricia Mann or uh, uh, Pat I think if you'd like to call her some people call her by different names and she was 20 year old now listen these were both students um, he was a student and she was a nursing student. They'd known each other right from school. They was in a relationship. This was a lovely, happy couple with all their whole life in front of them. And on Valentine's Day in 1971, their lives were taken. And really, up until today, as I said, this case remains unsolved. Now, a lot of people write, you know, they was walking in the woods because it was this lover's lane thing and they were found about half a mile in actually from this lovers lane in the woods park this is where their bodies were found so people always write you know they this lovers walk and it would be the last walk they've ever took now there's things found in the car that suggest that they actually probably were forced out the car i would believe rather than got out of their car and walked there's issues there so as we go through this case we we'll sort of say it as we we know it i suppose but then we shall look at the evidence to think what else and what else could have happened. What made these kids, you know, two young lovers on Valentine's Day end up really being tortured and murdered? Because that's really what this case is about. It's about nothing else. It's about torture and murder. So you had young Jess. Now he was, or Jesse, he was literally um, a young student, fit, fit freshman at university. Right, I think it was the North Carolina State University and Patricia, she was a nursing student at Watts Hospital. Um, now, the whole of this investigation is mixed up from the beginning, but the most evidence from this investigation comes from this um, Captain Tim Horn, and I think his um, he had a partner, I can't remember her name now, but they're very, very good. Now, they've done a lot over the years after this case was closed down because of no evidence and everything, and it was reopened, really, um, by him. And this one, you know, this one straight state, um, you know, sheriff's department in, in Orange County is really focused on this cold case, actually, and has done so much work in it to try and bring light on what really could have happened here. So, really, this is all the information taken is really from their investigation and they have to take credit for that because they've worked long and hard on this investigation really but the problem is with any case that we deal with when we're looking back really right up until the early 2020s really 2000s I suppose 2000s sorry we're looking at um, different agencies you know multiple agencies working um, these cases but in them days, you see where you had, you had, it was, it was a um, county line case because they was murdered right on the county lines of, I think, Durham County. And that was held by the police department there, Durham County Police Department. And because then it was on the border of Orange County, then you had the Orange County Sheriff's Department. You had the FBI, the SBI. And no one in this case was working together. 
right? So the, this, the outline of this case is, is sketchy because yes, we know these people were murdered on that night. Their bodies were found two weeks later by a surveyor. So this is sort of the outline. Then each one of these um, police departments or agencies started really separate, separately looking in to this case because they all wanted to find the killer but no one was sharing the information to be able to really do that. In those days they didn't share, they wanted to be known as the people that solved this case. Now they're going to say this to self, you know, th this, and this has changed now. All these agencies, all these police departments, all these county lines are really gone because now everyone works together because it's easier and usually because it is such close to the county line where these bodies were found. The perpetrator could have come from anywhere, literally anywhere, especially one of these two counties, which are quite, you know, Orange County is quite a big county as well. So you, you are, you need to work together. And I think over the years, this is what's happened. And this Tim Horn, he put together this literally massive investigation as a cold case and invited everyone from these different various um, you know, police agencies and a lot of these police agencies didn't know half the material that was in it because that hadn't been shared to them in the beginning so that could have been a reason why this case wasn't solved and we're talking about a 1971 case right which was an old you know it's a historic case when you want to look at it like that the you know the technology was different then was everything was different in 1971 so as now we've come up with the new data and the new um, you know um, stuff on uh, DNA like this MVAC now that's used I think there's 80 in the world MVACs which can um, really use small amounts of DNA or capture small amounts of DNA from certain places now also because these poor young people were tied up there was rape involved and you can get DNA because someone in them days in 1971 wasn't thinking about their DNA being collected at some point later on down the line was they they never was in 1971 that's not what was on their mind it wasn't invented then or it was but it wasn't out right it was never even used up until that point so you can imagine can't you the DNA that would be there on this stuff, and as I always say with DNA, as long as it's stored right, protected right, collected right, you know, um, there is DNA, and DNA can last a very, very long time, especially when you've tied knots and you've used a rope. You can imagine, can't you, the cells that's coming off your hands and stuff that will be over that. So this is why I think at some point down the line, this case may be solved but whether it's solved in time to where the person that the perpetrator of this crime is still alive that's another question but with any this is quite a terror this was a terrible murder right there's terrible murder the crime scene was terrible these kids were you know tortured as i said before death um there would be evidence they were stabbed and that's so there would be DNA evidence from the perpetrator at this crime scene but it all depends on how it was collected how it was kept stored looked after right up until now nearly 50 years later yeah about 50 years isn't it later from this this murder 51 years you know DNA doesn't it does deteriorate but with these new MVACs this new technique, and I think there's 40 of them actually in America that they can use, and I think this, there is one I think um, in Guilford County Sheriff's Office has one, and they ha are using it to test the rapes and stuff from this crime scene, right? So there's things that can happen. It's a, it's a really sad case, this. Now, it's on the 12th of February 1971, this young couple, promising futures, abducted, to uh, tortured, and murdered. Um, Jess McBain, 19, was a popular athletic, smart university student 
um, his fiancée was his high school sweetheart. They were always together and they were absolutely a beautiful couple. They loved each other. They had their whole life in front of them and she was 20 year old and she was uh, Patricia Mann or Pat, however you'd like to have called her. Now she was this nursing student and um, this night, it was the 12th. Now with um, Jess, him and his brother shared the car Right, so, and it wasn't actually his night to have the car, it was his brother's night to have the car, but he asked his brother, he said, listen, I want to take her out, it's Valentine's time, you know, I want to take her out, and can I, we swap times, you know, days for the car, and the brother said, yeah, that's fine, great, you know, take her out, and that's what he did, he picked her up, and off they went, and there was a dance, I think, at the um, hospital, where she was training to be a nurse. The hospital was the Watts Hospital in Durham, and this was um, what the police said really um, was the last time really that they were seen by a lot of people. So they'd gone there. Now the, you know, the thing is, because she was a nursing student, uh, there, there's certain time zones that you have to be in by, right? There's curfews. And they'd extended this curfew at this um, uh, hospital for these students to go to their dance and everything, because it was put on by them. It's this Valentine's dance. And they were then extended that time to come home, come had to be back in for 1am. Now, um, Patricia was well known to never, ever breach anything. She was a perfect student, she was a perfect nurse, she was a perfect person really. She never broke any rules and if that curfew was 1 o'clock, she was, would have been well in before 1 o'clock in the morning and had never, ever breached any of the curfews um, up until this this day. So after this dance had all ended, of course, you know, young lovers, you know, you're talking about 1971, young lovers, and there was the land and stuff around near this place was being developed. So it was called something different at that time than what it is now. And it had the cul-de-sacs all gone in, but no houses. And you used to have lots of people, young lovers, using these cul-de-sacs somewhere to meet you know in their cars have a bit of time together and everything and it was sort of called this lovers lane that's what these were called and certain people had their own little cul-de-sacs their Jews and there's others but there was another cul-de-sac or another place called um, uh, lovers lane which was about half a mile from this area which also had a um, cul-de-sac but it was sort of in the woods of about half a mile into the wood, right? But it was sort of linked, but you had to drive to it. Now, Jess's car was found at the first site. His car was found there, but their bodies were found in this other cul-de-sac in a wooded area. You know, this one that you had to drive into, and it, you know, in there. But that the car wasn't found there. The car was found in the first one. They was found here. Now they could have walked from that cul-de-sac, got out that car and walked from that cul-de-sac into the woods. Of course they could have. They could have. But this was a rainy sort of dark night, you know. This wasn't a beautiful evening. This wasn't a summer beautiful evening. This was a rainy cold night. Now that's relevant when we get further into this case. It really is. So anyway, this, this couple, they've gone off, you know, they've had their dance, they've got in their car, they've drove off to this lover's lane to these cul-de-sacs where all these youngsters used to meet and have fun and be young, really, be young. Very hard-working students, had a whole life ahead of them, probably planning their future, as me and you did in our 20s. You know, it, it's just, they were just lovely. And everyone said who knew them, who knew of them. Um, both of these kids were absolutely lovely, hard-working kids. So they've gone and that was it. She didn't make her curfew at 1 a.m. in the morning. She didn't turn up, which as I said was very, very unusual for her. So alarm bells started to ring. All of a sudden no one's seen these pair at all. So there's a then an issue gone out to the police. The family and the friends have notified the police and they've said a missing person. So they've described them, described the car, described everything. Well, the police at that time, and I, you know, and you, you've got to think these are university students, it's Valentine's 
weekend. Valentine's, a lot of people elope, they go off, they get married, they come back and say, hi, you know, we're back, we're married. You know, in this country, they go to Gretna Green. I think uh, in America, it would be Las Vegas or somewhere like that. But this is what the police, I think, thought what happened. The families and friends never, ever thought that at all. They thought it was highly unlikely, actually highly out of character, for any of these two, this pair, to do anything like that at all. They had a feeling that something was seriously wrong, right from the minute that this girl did not turn up and at, on that curfew, back to her you know, hospital where she was staying as a living, really trainee nurse in her accommodation, her you know, student accommodation. Um, when she didn't turn back up there at, at one o'clock in the morning, they knew. So what they decided to do, because the police at that time wasn't taking much notice of what was going on and said this is what happened, they've just run off their turn up. The families and friends weren't having none of that and then done their own search and went out and looked for their own stuff and decided that, you know, we're going to take this into our own hands. And um, Jess's car was found then by them, not by the police, at this site. It was locked and their coats were in the back of the car. So this is what I can't get with the fear is that they got out the car and they walked into this lover's lane, you know, into the woods, half a mile into the woods, near these trees. Because let's be honest, right? If you're going to go into the woods and you want to have a little bit of quiet time on your own, you'd have took them coats, you'd have took a blanket, you'd have took something, wouldn't you? Their coats were still on the back seat of the car, which seems to me that someone has got them out of that car. Now, whether that's by force, that they've forcefully removed them from that car because it didn't look like there's any force, or has someone they knew encouraged them out of this car and said, come and look at this, I need help, whatever, and they've jumped out of this car, they've locked the car, all the stuff in there, and they've gone. But I don't believe that they've walked into this wood on their own, for their own reasons, not for the reasons that the police would want you to believe. I don't believe that at all, because it wasn't a great evening to be walking around, no matter how much in love you are, with no coats. And if you was going out there to do other things, you would have took your coats, you would have took something to lay on. They didn't. They didn't. So it makes me think that someone's encouraged them in some way, for some reason, to leave that car willingly and follow them into that wood. Then they were attacked. Now this attack was brutal. This poor young couple in love, out for a good time, was, as I said, led into this wood or had been approached in this wood by someone, probably someone that knew them. Probably. I, I, I believe they probably knew them, without a doubt, because of the way the crime was. Now you're talking about Jess. This boy was a fit athlete. A fit athlete. And so was there more than one person, could have been, to overpower this young boy? really did they inject him with something did they do something to him to incapacitate him to you know to tie this boy up he was tied to a tree as was she as was um patricia tied round the tree her hands tied and their hands tied behind their back they had ropes around their head and their neck and it proved under autopsy that they were tortured so they were slowly strangled, then released. Strangled and released several times before they were really um, stabbed to death as well. They were probably already dead though from the strangulation. Continually loosening, tightening, loosening, tightening. And in the end, it was loosened and they slumped forward. So, we have now a 19 year old fit, fit athletic student and a young 20 year old girl, fit as well, going into the woods and being attacked in this way. Why would he 
be submissive to be tied up by this person. There was no rings, no watches were stolen. It wasn't theft. This wasn't theft. There was no theft involved here. This was pure torture and murder of these two youngsters. But, so there's questions here that haven't been answered in any investigation, really, I don't think, what's come out. Listen, there are suspects, there is one main suspect, and that's a doctor that used to work at the same hospital, uh, this Watts Hospital in Durham, as um, Patricia. But you're talking about one person. So this is what I'm saying, how did he incapacitate Jess? Because Jess would have fought back, I'm sure. Or was it someone in authority that he felt he couldn't, you know, say anything? He was doing as he was told. Now, at the time of this murder, the land that they were found on was privately owned. It's not now, but it was at that time. Now, um, you know, did he think, oh, they were trespassing? Is there different things? Did someone knew some ruse to do something? But I can't get over why you have two youngsters, really, capable, capable of fighting and running off. But they didn't. They really didn't. They were, they, they were tied up. Now, whether, as I said, he's incapacitated him in any way, and I think that's probably what's happened, or did he have a gun? Because he didn't use a gun at that point it within this attack at all. But did he threaten him with a gun? There was some reason why they were both willing, um, you know, really, for this man to get the upper hand of them. And I'm going to say it's a man because the way this murder was done, the way it was done. So there are questions to this. So as I said, with this DNA technique now that's coming out, let's hopefully we'll find some evidence on that because there is no evidence to say about this doctor and this main suspect of this uh, in this case because he won't give his DNA, which we could say would incriminate him anyway, you know, but in America you need more than that. They have a right to say no. He was straight on to the lawyer and said, no, I'm not giving DNA. I personally, if I hadn't done anything wrong and I didn't want to be incriminated in any way or have any, you know, mention of anything or even be suspect in anything, will give my DNA straight away. He has not, and he has always, up until today, refused to do that. So the work continues here. But anyway, two weeks after um, the car was found by the family, the police did take it more seriously, and then a surveyor found their bodies in a, in a terrible, terrible way, really, um, in this like lover's lane lay-by, about half a mile in to the woods, tied up and slumped over these trees in a terrible, terrible state. So this case is a disturbing case, I think, because someone here has got away with murder. They really have. Double murder, really. It was a horrific, frenzied attack on these two at the end. The torture of the strangling and release, strangling, release. It's a signature, isn't it? And they must have looked if there's any other cases within this area at this time that was going on, and they haven't found any, or else we would have known about it. And they would have linked them together. But what would the DNA, right, these MVACs will bring, if we can get any DNA from them at all, really, now after all these years, and um, as long as they were looked after is that maybe this person was random. They were chose randomly because you had lots of lovers in this area at this time, you know, in all these little cul-de-sacs and all this little land and stuff. You had bottles and drinks and um, cigarettes and everything thrown in the area where these were murdered. But that makes forensics even harder because you have a lot of people now that's used this area over a long period of time. So it was well known as a lover's lane, wasn't it? So did someone target them, or was they just in the wrong place at the wrong time? When someone thought, I'm gonna kill someone tonight, and that's what they did. 
so hopefully the DNA if they ever get it and I'm sure they will at some point get something on this case and whether I said whether this case will be solved in a way that the perpetrator will you know the families will have justice and the perpetrator will serve time for his crime is probably unlikely right as the years go on because the perpetrator could already be dead couldn't they but I think what this case will show us maybe is if this DNA technique can be used and can really bring out a really good sample of the DNA of the killer of these two. I would be interested to see if this perpetrator is then linked to any other crimes within that time and on or before. Because I don't think this was this perpetrator's first crime and I doubt if it was his last. So thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the Valentine, Valentine's Day um, case. You know, it's a lovely time of year, Valentine's, isn't it? But you see murder happens on any day. People don't care, do they, about certain days. But I hope that you enjoy your day. I hope you have a great day. And I hope to see you again soon. So thank you for watching. And until the next time, bye-bye.